Syria's war is a mess. After four years, the conflict is divided between four different sides on the ground. Each side has different foreign backers, and those foreign backers don't even agree with one another about who they're fighting for or who they're fighting against. To understand all this, the crisscrossing interventions, the moving battle lines, it helps to go back to the beginning of the war and watch how it unfolded. The first shots in Syria's war are fired in March of 2011 by Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad and peaceful Arab Spring demonstrators. In July, some of the protesters start shooting back, and some Syrian troops even defect from Assad's army to join them. They call themselves the Free Syrian Army, and the uprising becomes a civil war. Extremists from Syria and from around the region start traveling to join the rebels. Assad actually encourages this by releasing jihadist prisoners to tinge the rebellion with extremism, make it harder for foreigners to back them. In January of 2012, Al-Qaeda forms its new branch in Syria called Jabhat al-Nusra. Also around then, Syrian Kurdish groups who've long sought autonomy take up arms and de facto secede from Assad's rule in the north. That summer is when Syria becomes a proxy war. Iran, which is Assad's most important ally, intervenes on his behalf. By the end of 2012, Iran is sending daily cargo flights and has hundreds of officers on the ground. At the same time, the oil-rich Arab states on the Persian Gulf begin sending money and weapons to the rebels, mainly to counter Iran's influence and mainly through Turkey. Iran steps up its influence in turn in mid-2012 when Hezbollah, which is a Lebanese Shia group backed by Iran, invades to fight alongside Assad. Now, the Gulf states respond by sending even more money and weapons to rebels, Saudi Arabia really leading the effort at this point, and this time going a lot through Jordan, who also opposes Assad. And by 2013, the Middle East is divided between generally Sunni powers on one side supporting the rebels and Shias on the other side supporting Assad. Now that April, the Obama administration, horrified by Assad's atrocities, signs a secret order authorizing the CIA to train and equip Syrian rebels. But the program stalls out at first. At the same time, the U.S. quietly urges the Arab Gulf states to stop funding extremists, but their requests go ignored. In August, Assad uses chemical weapons against civilians in the town of Ghouta. Men, women, children lying in rows, killed by poison gas. It is in the national security interests of the United States to respond to the Assad regime's use of chemical weapons through a targeted military striker. Russia proposed on Monday that Syria su uh, surrender control over its chemical weapons to the international community for its eventual dismantling to avoid a U.S. military strike. The U.S. ends up backing down, but the whole thing establishes Syria as a great powers dispute, with America against Assad and Russia backing him. Just weeks later, the first American training in arms through that CIA program finally reach Syrian rebels. The U.S. is now a participant in the Syrian war. In February of 2014, something happens that transforms the war. An Al-Qaeda affiliate, mostly based in Iraq, breaks away from the group over internal disagreements over Syria. The new group calls itself the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, and it becomes Al-Qaeda's enemy. ISIS doesn't fight Assad. Instead, it fights the other rebels, and it fights the Kurds carving out a mini-state in Syria that it calls its caliphate. Now, that summer, it marches across Iraq, seizing territory and galvanizing the world against it. Then, in September, almost exactly one year after it almost bombed Assad in Syria. We're moving ahead with our campaign of airstrikes against these terrorists, and we're prepared to take action against ISIL in Syria as well. That summer, the Pentagon launches its own program to train Syrian rebels. But unlike the CIA program, this one will only train rebels who fight just ISIS, not Assad. And the program fizzles out, showing that America now opposes ISIS more than Assad, but also that there's really no like-minded force on the ground in Syria. In August, Turkey begins bombing Kurdish groups in Iraq and in Turkey, even as Kurds are fighting ISIS in Syria. Turkey also doesn't bomb ISIS in Syria. All of this deepens tension with the US over this question of whether they need to treat Assad or ISIS the primary enemy, and creates a lot of confusion among the Kurds about where the US stands. Now Assad has been losing ground all this time, to ISIS, to the rebels, and in September of 2015, Russia intervenes in his behalf. Russia says it's there to bomb ISIS, but in fact it just bombs the anti-Assad rebels, including some rebels who are backed by the US. So as it stands now, there are lots of different groups and outside countries involved in Syria's war. And even among allies, there are big disagreements about who their enemies are, who to support, and how to do it. And those contradictions are a big part of why, for this war, there is just no end in sight.